Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> if you recognize this sermon uh, from last week, that's right, because it is from last week. I forgot to change the title. Uh, the title is actually uh, Free Indeed. And we'll be, we'll be thinking about John chapter 8. Uh, so if you want to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 8, we'll be going through that, uh, that story verse by verse. Environments affect you. Uh, you. You all know that, right? Environments affect you. The place where you grow up, oh, you changed it. Look at that. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, don't ever talk bad about my PowerPoint, guys. They rock. Okay, so... Um, Environments, environments affect you. The place where you grow up affects you. The place where you work affects you. The place where you live affects you. Uh, the place where you go to school affects you. It changes the way that you think, the way that you act, the way that you behave. Uh, your environment can oppress you or it can free you. Okay? And, and you all know, you can all think of examples of hard workplaces where it, it just every day you came home and just threw the load of weight off your back because it was just too much to bear. It was so hard, right? And you can also think of places in your life that you would go to and when you, when you got home, it was, just, it was just like you just felt refreshed. You just felt like it was a, it was a wonderful place to be, like it freed you, Okay? Well, we're going to be talking about how environments change us, okay, today. And, um, and there are two major environments we're going to be talking about, right? In John chapter 8, Jesus uh, is speaking to people who John says had believed in him, <clears throat> okay? That's, a, that's the first verse in, uh, in verse 31. It says uh, Jesus was speaking to those who had believed in him. And we're not totally sure what that means or what their kind of current state was. If they, were, if they had believed and were continuing to believe in him or if they had believed and were now kind of backing off from him. All right? But Jesus gives them a teaching about uh, different homes. Okay? He gives them a teaching about different homes. And the first thing he does when he speaks to them is he gives them a wonderful invitation and he invites them to make their home with him, okay? Invites them to make their home with him. Now, you may not see this here, uh, but let's just read through it, okay? So your Bible probably says this, like mine does. It says, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said this, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So many of your Bibles probably say, if you hold to my teaching, okay? If you hold to my teaching. And that's fine. That's a fine translation of that. But it doesn't really get at that word. It's, a, it's, a, it's especially this word is called meno, all right? It's, that's the Greek word. It's called meno. Maybe some of your Bibles also say, um, if you were to read the King James Version, it probably says, if you continue in my teaching, okay? And that's, that's, that's similar. That's a fine translation. Um, if, you have, if you're reading the ESV Bible, it will say this. It will say, if you abide in my teaching, uh, and that is, that's getting closer, okay, uh, to, to what we're getting at. Meno is a very kind of household word. This, this word meno, this word to hold to or to live or to abide in. It's a very household word, and it means to dwell in or to like set up shop in, okay, or to live in. I put, I put that in parentheses there, to live in. That's the idea that Jesus is working with, and he's inviting these kind of had-been disciples to come and live and dwell in his word, to make their home in his word. Okay? Now, uh, he makes the same invitation to us with the same promise. He says to us, come, be my disciples, come, live, make your home, abide in my word. Okay? Now, that, that word, uh, like abide or to live in, I think generally means two things, all right? It means to give space and time, and it means to give authority, all right? To give space and time and to give authority, now, this is not an, always an easy thing for us in our busy lives. I mean, I talk to some of you, and I know myself that life is busy. And to make time and a home and space for the Lord can sometimes 
come at the end of the day uh, when you're totally tired and exhausted and don't have much left to give. Right? Or uh, you can maybe never really find time for it. But Jesus is calling us in this passage. He says, if you make my home, or if you make your home in my word, you will be free and you will know the truth. Okay? So I think we should, we should heed this word and take it seriously that to give space and time, to carve out moments of our day, carve out uh, space in our home where we say, listen, this, this time, beginning of the day, end of the day, uh, this is time for the Lord, okay? We're going to talk about the Lord. We are going to fill our home with his word. We are going to talk about his teaching. Uh, and, and we're going to make our house with him. Okay? And that's a fight that you have to make. That's a fight that you have to do. It's not an easy one because the world will always be sort of vying for your attention and vying for your affection and looking uh, to take your gaze away from the Lord and from his word. Right? So, and then the second thing it means that I said is that, that it gives some level of authority to your life. Okay? Uh, that when you hear God's word spoken, it just doesn't go into a vacuum and into vapor uh, for you never to remember in one ear, out the other. But you actually take time and say, if this is the word of the Lord, if this is the God of the universe who has spoken and he's spoken it to me, then that word should hold some authority in my life, right? That word, what he says, should own me, should, should own the things that I do, the things that I think, the things that I... Uh, uh, desire, and, and, and I should make my home in his word by giving him space and time and authority, okay? Now, I think what's interesting about this passage is Jesus just says, hold to my teaching, make your home in my word. But he doesn't, he doesn't give any stipulations to that, okay? He makes no demands. He's not saying, uh, at, at 5 o'clock in the morning, you have to wake up and, and praise me and open up my word. You have to be speaking at all times. You have to be doing all this, do, doing all that. He just makes an invitation and says, make your home in my word. It's a free invitation of grace that he gives uh, to his disciples to come and abide with him. I don't think Jesus is meaning this invitation to be especially difficult, actually. Okay? He apparently leaves the matter of how to live in Jesus' home to each believer and to Jesus' own continual directing and nudging and encouraging word uh, to our own consciences in our own lives, right? He just says, make your home with me. Make your home with me. Please just come and live with me, would you? And he promises two things uh, at the heading and, uh, of this invitation. He says, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, the truth is this, okay? The, the truth that he's talking about is one, that God is present in Jesus Christ. That God is present in Jesus Christ. But then additionally, it's everything else uh, that we imagine in that kind of noblest word of truth. When Jesus says you will know the truth, to abide in his word, to live in his word, the product of that is that you will begin to see and understand and, uh, and see the world for what it really is, okay? See reality for what it really is. See yourself, see God for who he really is and for who you really are, okay? That is, that is the byproduct of living in his word is that you will know the truth and everything that comes with it. And then it's second, that it will set you free, okay? Freedom uh, to Jesus and in John's gospel specifically means liberty and f like the forgiven and reconciled life that we have with God in Jesus' name, okay? And then additionally, it means everything else that freedom means, okay? Almost everything else that freedom means. We kind of have a crazy view of freedom in our world. Um, but true life, true freedom comes in Jesus' name through forgiveness and reconciliation with God and through the knowledge that we do not have to work for our own salvation, that we are free to live for him. Right? Now you would expect when Jesus says this to these disciples, when he says, hey, come live with me and two things will happen. You'll be free and you'll know the truth. Okay? You would expect that the response would be overwhelmingly, sure, sure. Yeah, we'll come live with you. Absolutely. We're in. 
You had me at come and stay. I'm in. Let's go. The freedom and the, the, freedom and the truth, that's, a, that's just a byproduct. I, I'm coming. This is great. But uh, the, the response is actually quite shocking, right? Because the disciples of Jesus don't say, we're in. We're coming. We're going to come live with you. But instead, uh, and in our life today, many believers said and will say, we don't need you, Jesus, right? We don't need you, Jesus. And that is essentially what his, uh, his kind of had-been disciples say in this passage as well. It says they answered him, listen, we are Abraham's descendants, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say then that we shall be free? How can you say that we shall be set free? See, they, they don't think that they have any problems or at least uh, any bondage at all. They are, they are free people. They're sons of Abraham. How on earth could you say that we're not free? They don't bring any problems to their relationship with Jesus. In fact, uh, they bring pedigree. They bring privilege. Uh, and it's of the highest sort. They are the Jews. They are seeds of Abraham. How could anybody uh, possibly enslave them when they are the freest people on the planet? It is apparently Jesus who needs them, not them who need Jesus. Jesus' promise of truth and freedom, apparent, uh, freedom apparently sound more uh, like a threat than a promise. And so they are insulted that Jesus promises them something they honestly believe they already have, freedom. So this is the lesson for us, okay? This is the lesson for us. If we believe that we have no or few problems, if we think that we are fundamentally uh, in good shape, before we meet Jesus and join in his discipleship, if we think that we ultimately don't really need his promise of truth or freedom in life, then there should be serious question of whether we really are believers in Jesus at all, right? Are we not rather believers in ourselves, right? Because if we're believers in Jesus, yet we think we have no sin, then... then and he is at least a savior, right? So if he's our savior, yet we have no sin, then what, what, do we, what do we need him for, right? If there's nothing wrong in our life, if there's, nothing, if there's nothing to own, if we think that fundamentally, like, we're probably okay. The good will outweigh the bad, and like, in the end, we'll probably be all right. Then we should seriously question whether we understand the gospel at all. So in our day, I believe that much of like the apathy and sort of dwindling numbers in the church today stem from an underlying belief that we ultimately don't actually need God, right? We have uh, philosophies that comfort us by telling us, if you're a good person, okay, it's just a matter of karma, all right? You just, one side has to outweigh the other. And, uh, and if you're good works, if, if, if you're a good person, Ultimately, God's a nice guy. He'll be okay. Uh, you'll get in, all right? And, that, and that, that, that is so prevalent in our society that people say that over and over and over again. Well, you know, I, I've done a lot of good things. You know, I, I've, been a, I've been a relatively good person. I feel like, I feel like things are going to be okay. I, I don't actually need God. I don't actually need a Savior, right? We have scientific theories that convince us of our origins and reality and the future uh, and all sorts of things. Everything from evolution uh, to, uh, to global warming. They're all just origins and theories of end times, right? And we say we are convinced that we know the truth, right? We don't actually need, need God's word. We can look around. We can read the charts. We can look at the signs of the time and know that... Uh, we understand the truth. We understand reality even better than God's word does. So why do we need that? Right? Why do we need that at all? We have uh, political movements that give us hope for a future, give us a person to believe, with, to believe in. You know, I'm with her, or I'm with him, or I'm with this person, or I'm with that person. And I have a hope and a future I can believe in because of this person. So do I actually need God? Right? No, I, I, I have political figures I can believe in. Uh, we have 
internet that, you know, that satiates all desires that we ever have. You know, why, why do I need people? Why do I need a church uh, when I have Facebook? I mean, I have Am Amazon, I have Facebook, I have Netflix. I'm pretty much good to never go outside for the rest of my life, right? <laughs> why do I need God? I have entertainment. Why, why, why would I want to go to a church and sing songs uh, and be filled with some sort of joy or happiness, right? But when, when, like, I've got all sorts of things that make me happy around the world, right? We have money. Or we don't have, don't have money. Uh, <laughs> but are always sort of convinced that if we did, we would be able to do whatever we want, Right? We would be able to have freedom if I just had enough money, like I could, I could get a car, or I could not work, or I could get the house I wanted, or I could get the clothes I wanted, and all the things I really desire that are so restrictive on me, uh, if I just had money, those would not be a problem, or at least not be as big of a problem, so I would be free. So why on earth do I need Jesus when I can just get a better job, you know? It's, or, or, or just invest in a bank account or invest in the stock market or something, you know? These are all hopes that we look to for a savior, for something to make us free, to give us truth, uh, and, to, and to satisfy the need that our own guilt has to free us from the guilt that we feel. Believers in Jesus who do not think that they need Jesus' freeing home of discipleship and the invitation that he gives us are in the greatest bondage of all, right? Because they don't even recognize that they are enslaved. And they need to hear the coming word that Jesus tells them very much, okay? So Jesus replies to them and says that nothing but Jesus, nothing else in the entire world can free you except for him, except for Jesus. He says this in reply. I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus is not asking these had-been disciples to stop doing something, you'll notice, okay? He's not, he's not asking them to stop doing some sin. He's not saying, uh, you know, your life is in bondage to adultery or lust or money or greed or whatever. He never, he never says that, right? The sin that they have is not a sin uh, 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 like against the Ten Commandments necessarily, but it is a sin of self-righteousness. It's a sin fundamentally against the first commandment, uh, that there shall be no other gods before God himself. These guys are putting something else above all of that, right? He's asking them to stop believing in their own pedigree, to stop believing in somebody in the past, He's, uh, to stop believing in their own family. Right? He's saying all of these things will fundamentally, ultimately enslave you. But if you want to be free, that comes from me. Do you ever think about the fact that this, this is an interesting thing that Christians do that almost no other religion in the entire world does, right? That Christians not only confess their sins that they commit against God, but we also confess our own good works, right? We confess the things that we are good at. We confess the things that we are uh, righteous for. We confess the things that we think are great, right? And we say that even those, even those, if we hope in them, will utterly fail us, right? You show me another religion in the entire world that looks at its own good deeds and says, they're filthy rags, Right? Everything that I have that, that the world would clap at or applaud at or say this is great or wonderful, it's my shame. Right? It's my filthy rag. And the only thing that I hang my hat on, the only thing that frees me in the entire world is the gospel of Jesus Christ and him. Right? And that is what Jesus is trying to get these disciples to see. That the things that they hold most dear are oftentimes the biggest threats to their faith, right? We don't often think of being converted from our own righteousness, but that's exactly what's happening here. It's exactly what's happening here. 
And that's the first sign that you really begin to understand the gospel. When you look at even your own good works and even the, the good things that happen in your life and you say, these are nothing, right? If it were not for the grace of God, I wouldn't have any of these things. And, and, and in the face of God and in the face of, of, of him who does wonderful deeds, these are, these are filthy rags, right? When you begin to see that, not only, when you begin to see that not only does sin keep you from God, but maybe even more dangerously, our own hope in our good deeds, then you are beginning to understand the gospel, I think. <clears throat> so it's the 499th uh, anniversary of the Reformation. And you, many of you guys maybe don't know that much about the Reformation, and that's fine. Uh, but on this day, 499 years ago, uh, a guy named Martin Luther went to the doors uh, of his church, his Catholic church, who had uh, drastically left the teaching that we just laid out in the freedom that comes through the gospel. And he nailed a letter to the wall, okay? And it had 99 different, uh, or 95 different uh, problems or issues that he saw in the church's teaching, okay? And the first one on that list was this. He says, when our Lord Jesus Christ said, repent, he desired that the entire life of believers to be one of repentance, okay? When the Lord said, repent, he desired that the, the entire life of believers be one of repentance. If you just think about that for a minute, it's very interesting, okay? It means that all our life, the point of us being Christians and the proclamation of the church is that we have nothing to bring before God that would make us righteous. Our whole life is repentance. And that means like time-wise, that every day of our lives we say, Lord, we repent. We don't have anything before you besides Jesus. Okay? But it also means that every part of our lives, okay, we say, Lord, uh, my wonderful family, doesn't, doesn't do anything to make me righteous. That's all a gift from you. Uh, and ultimately, ultimately it, it doesn't do anything to make me righteous before your eyes, right? It's all yours, okay? We give everything over to God. That was, what, that was the first thing that he nailed to the door of the church and said, this is what it actually means to be Christian, to lay down everything we have, our heritage, our pedigree, our good deeds, our sins, our problems, every one of them goes down at the feet of the cross so that God can redeem all of them through the cross and through his son, Jesus. Jesus says something interesting here, right? He says, uh, slaves are never permanent members of the house, right? And, and any, any sort of servant or slave during this time would know that, right? That when his job was up, he wasn't getting an inheritance. He wasn't getting to, like, to, to uh, stay in the house of his, of his owners. He wasn't getting uh, like the good food. He wasn't getting all these things. He, wasn't ha he didn't have a future in the house of his owners. But the son does, Jesus says. Okay? The son has, is, is, is a part of the household forever. And he gives this promise. He says, so if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. But the question you ask yourself is, well, will the Son set us free? Will he set us free? And that is what the cross was all about, right? Jesus answered that with a resounding yes in every gospel. That on the cross, he set us free from our sin, from our bondage, to make us sons in his home. Sons, daughters, family of his heavenly father in his heavenly house. Paul says later in Galatians, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free, not may set you free or will set you free, but has set you free now in this place. And then he says, stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. And that slavery is our own good deeds, our own sins, and all the things that we look to and hope for, for a future and promise. So let us heed as Paul calls us to and cling to the freedom that is in Christ alone and not go back and look ever again 
at a hope that is less than what Jesus has won for us on the cross. Let's pray. Lord God, you have set us free uh, for freedom. And we pray that as people of your Son and your name, we would live as free people in this world uh, and would proclaim the goodness uh, of the one in whom only freedom comes, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.